Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Comic Shop Talk on the Late Night Collectors community. I'm your host, Nico, and joined with me today, as always, is my co-host, Chris. How you doing, Chris? Hey, not too bad. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Well, do a hint, hint a little uh, slurring going on there, Chris. You all right over there? Or, uh, I'm back from the dentist there. Uh, my mouth's a little bit frozen, so I might be uh, sipping out of a, a cup here with a straw, just so I don't uh, have that coming all down my face. But it's coming back slowly. Yeah, your face looks so puffy, Chris. I don't know what's <laughs> going on. <laughs> no, I just figured I'd tease you about that. Don't worry, we're actually going to have a, a little, uh, a young girl is actually going to be yelling in the background during the pod. Oh. Kind of like the Rosen's daughter at the uh, at the Raptors game last night. There you go. I got the Raptors on my, uh, on my uh, tall boy, guys. <laughs> yeah. No more playoffs for them because of that. <laughs> okay. Save that can. It could be a... Uh... Yeah, it'd be a collector's item, you know. Hence the fact that it says limited edition on it. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, that's crazy! A little bit of basketball talk there for you guys. I read the headlines this morning or last night when it happened. I was like, "What the fuck is going?" on? <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, we're here to talk about comics here today, folks. That's Comic Shop Talk. Welcome back, and this is our weekly comic book review show where we talk about the weekly comics that we re we read week to week. We give you our thoughts on them. We show off some of the art from the books, give you our uh, your reviews on the books, let you know what we think of them. And uh, this week we're going to be talking about the – no, that's not the right date. <laughs> well, thankfully, I actually remember to put up the right banner this episode too, Chris. Last uh, last week uh, we had the something called the Late Night Chat Network on in the background of the <laughs> – I don't know what that's all about, but that's uh, that's actually our sister channel, not this one. We got the comic background going. Got a little cross promotion going on. That's right. Uh, we're actually gonna be talking about new comics for the week of April twelfth, twenty twenty three. Uh, there we go. I think that's correct <laughs> this week. And uh, make sure you're subscribed to the channel. And spoiler warning, guys. Uh, you know, be forewarned. We are gonna be talking about what happens in a lot of the books. Sometimes we try to avoid big spoilers. Sometimes we talk about everything that happened in the issue. So just be forewarned because we do show off the art to give you an idea of what that looks like and talk about the books. And uh, yeah, all that good stuff. Hit the like button, the thumbs up. Make sure you hit the notification bell to be notified of when these shows come out. And uh, usually either Friday or Saturday, they drop every week. You can also follow us on Instagram for up to date, uh, you know, schedules and all this kind of stuff. And also, finally, a couple more plugs for other shows that we've actually had come out over the last couple of weeks. That I think I failed to mention because uh, it's been a while since we had some other stuff. But we have other shows here in the Late Night Collectors community as well. We had a new episode a couple of weeks back of Kraken Packs with the chat. Uh, that's uh, Christine was on that one. We opened up some new, uh, the new Pokemon card set, which is... Uh, uh fuck i think it's called violet and scarlet and violet or something like that that's the it's the new the new basically block like the new region of pokemon like so it's been years and years since we've had like a new kind of region in the pokemon games and and everything for them to follow because it was sword and shield for a long long time so now uh this is the new first set of that kind of new direction for the next few years new new pokemon there's over over a thousand of these things now so we had a really good time recording that. All kinds of fun, uh, fun names of these new Pokemon and everything else that we uh, came across while recording that one. So uh, check that out. That's where we open up cards on the channel and chat about them. And also a more comic related thing that came out this week, actually. Uh, if you look back in the feed a couple of days ago, we just dropped a new episode of Trade Talk, the return of Trade Talk. Uh, Peter joined me for this one. And uh, Peter and me discussed the book Punisher Born which is uh, it's like a four issue mini series about like the origins of the Punisher back in like the Vietnam War, Frank Castle before he was the Punisher, essentially, which was uh, it's written by Garth Ennis, a really, really good mini series that I had suggested you check out. Uh, I've read it before and kind of revisited it for this chat. So, yeah, we kind of just did like a, you know, a deep dive discussion issue by issue, kind of talking about what happened in the book and reviewed it. So that was a really good one. Check that out too, guys. If you uh, have not yet seen that uh, new episode of Trade Talk. All right, Chris. That all being said. All right. Well, cheers and let's talk comics. Talk some comics. Oh, you got you got a little bit uh, on your no. <laughs> I think I'm freaking tasting all my like tooth dust or something in there. It's gross. <laughs> Well, I commend you for still uh, powering through, Chris. You're like, I'm going to get this beer down one way or the other. <laughs> All right. Storm Brought in the you by the fine people at Steam Whistle. There you go. <laughs> Shout out to them. 
Storm and the Brotherhood of Mutants number three is first up on the docket here today. Let me just bring this up. Chris, what'd you think of this one? Well, I kind of just read this quickly uh, just before the show. Um, <clears throat> I don't know. I guess this Storm one lost a bit of steam. That Just that narration there was driving me up the wall there. I don't know who that's supposed to be narrating that. The lettering, and, the lettering was fucking annoying, right? Like the yeah. like, this issue did a bad job of the way it was it was written out. Like I, I guess they were trying to make it like a let. I don't know, but did yeah, that's like I don't know. Supposed to be like some historical fact where they're just retelling this, like I guess the the heroics of Storm and I don't know. I know I thought there were some good you know some good beats in there with uh, Emma Frost being uh, the master mold. <clears throat> Well, you know, the rebirth of Storm. We just saw her die. They bring her back too soon already. And, you know, it's still like seeing uh, Sinister trying to figure out uh, how we can try and reset everything. But uh, overall, I didn't think it was a great issue. And I just don't know who these characters are still. You know, now that's 900, 900 years out. You know, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't know who they are and I don't really care about them. What do you think? I I I actually liked some of the events that happened in this issue, despite me feeling disconnected from these like thousand year kind of stories so far. Like I really didn't love the last issue of the Immoral X Men miniseries that we talked about last week, which I I think has been the best one uh, out of all three of these. Uh, this one's been all right. Uh, I liked this kind of Emma Frost moment where she kind of turned into this like you know what I mean this uh, yeah like the master mold or whatever. Yeah yeah yeah. I dug that. I dug that part of it. But I got to tell you, like, between the lettering and some of the art in this issue, I didn't love it either um, because of those things. I think that really dropped it for me. And like you said, like, it is hard to kind of get a grasp as to who some of these people are and what's going on. Uh, I do think some of the story beats or, like, references in this, like the Doombot and things like that, were things that we also did just see in the Immortal X-Men issue last week, which I think helped a little bit. Like, you know what I mean? Like, they're kind of trying to bring everything together, I think, at this point in time to end this Sins of Sinister, because you did see some some things kind of uh, working parallel to one another, like uh, from this and the Immortal X-Men series. But yeah, it was, it was fine. Um, but yeah, I didn't love the art in some spots and, and, the, and, the, and the lettering. Uh, which is something we don't normally talk about on this show unless it's done it, it's done uh, bad <laughs> badly like it wasn't this issue. Wait, how can you get lettering wrong? Jesus Louise, come on. But that's the thing about good lettering, though. That's actually I've heard other le actual letterers talk about that on podcasts before, like from the like in the business about. They said if you're a good letterer and you're doing your job right, it's something people don't comment on. Yeah, like it's, it's supposed to just gel well with the book, right? Like where. I think it's a little easier to kind of pick apart or, or review or talk about art because it's very subjective or the writing of a book because you may not like what you read. You know what I mean? But like lettering, like unless it's kind of like sticks out like a sore thumb, which it shouldn't, like it did in this issue. And you're like, what? you know what I mean? Like, yeah, so this is bad, um, bad lettering in this issue and just uh, an okay story, I would say. But yeah, so I don't know. What'd you give this one? I'll give it a 3.5. You know, I'm still waiting for that lead up to the, I guess the, the Omega event for whatever, the Omega book that Sins of Sinister and Dominion or something. So yeah. just get everything reset or whatever they end up doing. Uh, yeah, I'll agree with you in the 3.5. I, I would have given it less, but I did like some of the story beats that yeah. happened this issue, like I said. Like, if it wasn't for a couple of the moments that happened in this issue between, like, Storm and M Emma and everybody, like, I probably would have given it less because of those other reasons. But we'll stick at a 3.5. Uh, next up, we got Guardians of the Galaxy number one. Uh, you picked this one up. You got the cover of this, or yeah, that's right. the only reason I bought this is one of the Alex Ross covers. I think this is it here. Nice. And that was not, <clears throat> you know, I didn't expect much out of the Guardians of the Galaxy uh, comic. I think this stayed true more to the movie version of the the characters. You know, I guess we got Star Lord here. Who else was there? Gamora, Nebula, Mantis, Drax. There's no rocket. And it seems that Groot is, is an evil force or Groot. Yeah, it's Groot, right? Yeah. Yeah, Groot's like the, the evil force here. He's gone like freaking ballistic or something. He's like a Groot force. Uh, but uh, basically they're in the outer ridge of outer rim of space on some sort of uh like refugee planet almost, where it's just the worst of the worst. And they're going there just trying to save everybody because it seems that uh, this group force is chasing them. And 
for whatever reason, I don't know why they're trying to save the people of this town to begin with. Like they go out of their way to get these people out. Yeah. And uh, basically that's just the whole, the whole gist of the comic. Yeah. And these people are like, you know, a pain in the ass and don't want to play ball. And they're like hunkering down like these people. in the Yeah. You know, these are all supposed to be kind of like lawless rebels and like, Hey man, you got to get on this thing in the air. And yeah, it wasn't too bad. You know, it's, I think it's worth the price of admission. And, uh, you know, I might, I might read this online, continue to see what's going on. It was all right. Um, I'm a big fan of Kev Walker, the artist on this book. I really like his style. Um, I really like, I, I, he kind of bounces around quite a bit. I think he was just on Predator prior to this, like the Predator series, which I read some issues of and talked about here on the show. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I really love his, his stuff. So this kind of like that, this, that was nice to see him on this book. I like the intro of the book too. It kind of felt like a Western of sorts at, at, at the start, you know, yeah. the man coming to town type deal, like him on that like, speed bike and, I, I liked all that kind of stuff with the hat and everything like of star Lord. I, I dug it. So I did definitely like certain aspects of this. Uh, I guess that Groot thing is something that happened in the guardian series before this, that maybe the writer picked up on and kind of continued with. Cause I, 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 this is news to me that he's like, yeah, it could be just news to or new to the series. I don't know. And you know, maybe I'll explain it later on. Who knows? Yeah, because he's like a he's like a forest fire or something now, just blazing his way through fucking. Yeah, it's like the Phoenix Force almost. Or yeah, well, they're, they're referring to it as Groot Fall in this. That's what they're called. Oh, Groot Fall, yeah. Groot Fall. So like, yeah, but I mean, there were some good action scenes and the characterization was all right. Um, it wasn't bad. I didn't love it, but uh, yeah, Drax was pretty badass in his moments. And this, he like basically like yeah, raised this big robot or whatever the hell a ship yeah. or whatever the hell it was. Yeah, so that was cool. Uh, but yeah, there's Groot right there. He's kind of like a like a lame. Not that little cutesy one from the movie. No. Um, but yeah, it was it wasn't bad. Would you give it then out of five? Would you say? I'd probably just drop a three point five. But uh, interested to read more. Damn, I can't give it more either. I I might check out more online. I mean, I kind of just took a chance with this because it's been a while since I've read a Guardians book. Uh, the writers on this were the people that <clears throat> that were writing um, Captain America's series, which I really liked. When it, which, which I read recently and caught up on, or at least the tr first trade. And uh, and like I said, I like the artist. So yeah, maybe I'll I'll give it another go. <clears throat> Next up, we got Captain Marvel number forty eight, Chris. Yeah, this is one of the ones I've been reading online. I've been following Captain Marvel uh, for the last few issues, and I, you know, I thought it would be part of the cuts. Little did I know that they're going to be cutting the series. So if, if I was aware of that, I might have made the extra effort to buy these last few issues. I think I have Captain Marvel fifty on the on the pull list. But you know, I if it, if the series was continuing, I'd probably check out the next arc and see how it's going. This arc is starting to pick up a bit of speed, you know, now that it's crossing over with the X-Men. And uh, it's moving along. I thought the ending was pretty decent. And I'm just looking, I guess, to see this see this wrapped up and see what they got, got for issue number 50. Nothing too big to say. I, I, really, I, I really did one. one. The art looked really great on this issue. Yeah, I don't know. It just wasn't feeling those, like, even that picture there with her eyes supposed to being in space. I don't know. It just didn't get that. It just looked like something was wrong. And then they spent a lot of time in her mind, so it's supposed to be a little trippy. Mm. And I don't know. I've just been seeing that in a lot of the other comics, too. So that didn't seem to be, didn't hit me as anything new. Okay. And, uh, you know, I guess we're just trying to, I think Binary might have died here. I don't know. There seemed to be a, a scene there at the end where Captain Marvel's holding Binary's body, and it looks like she's got a good chunk of her midsection missing. So that looks pretty dead to me, but who knows? Like people, there, there is the picture there. Well, I don't know. People have a tendency to bounce back from mortal injuries like this every once in a while. So I thought that was something, you know, if I, it would make me want to have this issue if that is something going on. So it could be some sort of a big event that I, I'd like to hold on to. But otherwise, um, I still give it a three point five. Nothing too special going on in there. Okay. Next up, Superman Lost number two. Once again, I just I didn't have much from DC this week, so I just gave this a quick read online. There's all this hype about this white uniform and all this stuff going on, and I don't know the biggest takeaways for me with this is basically how Superman operates in space because uh, they're still, you know, describing. Uh, I guess there's some quantum or 
I don't know, some black hole disruptor that he had to put himself into. And it was basically like a time warp or a black hole or something. Some singularity event, I don't know, that he had to go there and and stabilize. And that's what sent him to the other side of space. So now his ship's out there and it seems that he can't breathe in space. And uh, he's been holding his breath for a long time and he had to make all these sort of... Uh, you have to MacGyver a whole bunch of things, like some liquid oxygen to put in his lungs and all that, and then he gets picked up by some, I don't know, some alien race, and they just drop him off in some planet in there. He's trying to figure out what's going on there. I don't know if I'll continue on reading this. You know, I was, I was interested in, the, in the, the writer. I think it's what Christopher Priest. I know he does a lot of the, the Draculina and um, what's the other one? Vampirella? Yeah, Vampirella stuff. So I just kind of wanted to see what he what he did in the mainstream stuff, but it's it's nothing super spectacular. But uh, I don't know. They still seem to be hyping this up, you know, with this white suit or he's getting some power upgrades or something that looks nice. Mm-hmm. But uh, I don't know. Not much meat to the story so far. I give this a three point five. Okay. Yeah, I was wondering if I should be checking it out or not, but if that's what you're saying, maybe I'll I'll pass on it for now. Yeah, there's some stuff with him back at home. That's about the interesting stuff is kind of how he's he's got like PTSD from whatever happened. You know, he's sleeping on the floor. He's not breathing at home. And, you know, I guess something messed him up good. So, you know, maybe there's more to come. Because mm. he does seem to be a bit shell-shocked when he's uh, back at home. Right. Okay. Uh, next up, we got Giant Cock Chew, number one. <laughs> I was going to try and give this one a read, but uh, I just ran out of time. <laughs> Oh, this is just ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 exactly what you you th- you would think, I guess, by the description of the the solicit. I mean, the nice thing about this is it is a three issue limited series, so like you're they're not trying to stretch this idea out for fucking you know a sixty issue run or anything like that. Um, Rock the big uh, hammer, looking at you. <laughs> Uh, but basically, uh, it's written by Jerry Duggan, who, you know, we're, we're a fan of his writing, uh, here on the channel for the most part. We, we do like some of the books he's done and, and, uh, Scott Koblish is an artist he's worked with in the past. I remember he, I think the first time they worked together was on Deadpool years ago, probably like 10 years ago now for Marvel, which I was a really big fan of. He used to do like the issues where Scott Koblish, like he can change his style up so he can kind of do like old throwbacky type looking styles as well. So they used to do every so often at the end of like a big arc or something on Deadpool, they would do an issue where they would pretend like it's done at a different period of Marvel comics and shit like that. So it was really fun and they would bring him on and then he would do like an older kind of like Marvel artist kind of style. And uh, yeah, so it was, I, I I'm a fan of when they work together and, and them doing a funny book like this. I'm not really surprised, I guess, in that sense, but basically, you know what? It's not as stupid as it seems. Cause they do try to like give it some sort of like storyline in the sense that like we're, we're now essentially, or even maybe in a very near, <laughs> not too distant future where we've, you know, we've, we've been harsh to the environment and nature, mother nature's a, <laughs> a bitch. And, she kind of comes back at us with this creature basically emerging out of like the water, the trash filled polluted fucking water. And it's basically like supposed to be like a symbolism, I guess, of, you know, what man has done to the world or something like that. That it kind of, he almost tries to make it like some sort of smart, like kind of like, uh, you know, like a uh, type of thing like that in the, in the dialogue in this, in this issue um, metaphor of some sort, it seems like he's trying to get at but when it really comes down to it, it's just this fucking big kaiju monster that's horny and basically shits. <laughs> he comes out of the water. He shits this like toxic sludge on a few bunch of folks. And then he proceeds to like, you know, tear his way through the city. And, you know, there's people getting, you know, killed in his path. And there's like when he shits, there's like all these like weird like creatures that come out of his shit. <laughs> And uh, and then he basically, you know, the military, of course, is coming in and there's a guy on the binoculars, see, you know, trying to like direct everything and it's going on. And, you know, they're coming in with planes and boats and whatever else and try to take this monster down like they do in these Godzilla type of movies. And he just basically grabs onto a, a building 
and just gives her, starts banging the shit out of this fucking man. <laughs> he, just, he just starts drilling the building. And yeah, you see basically here, like his fucking <laughs> on it. And then there's a, where all the dust is in that middle panel, you basically see like a, a spiky thing that I guess is his dick. And he's just like thrusting. The <laughs> uh, Cause I guess he's horny and horny and fucking a building is good enough for him, I guess. And, and then you basically get this panel here, this, this full splash page of this, you know, uh, spiky fucking purple dick thing that's coming off of the creature and, and there's people getting attacked by it and everything else. <laughs> so they're, they're basically putting out like the announcement to everybody to watch out for this thing. You might, you know, you might try to, uh, you know, have sex with you or something. I don't know. It's just ridiculous. <laughs> it's like, they're just like, watch out for him and his, his dick and everything else. And, and uh, yeah, at the end of the issue, they basically call this guy up that I guess they had seen some sort of like uh, um, cataclysmic event like this coming. Like he, I guess, had warned the government about it. I guess he was a government man that they thought was just a crazy crackpot guy. And they call him up and he's, uh, you know, getting sauced in a bar over, you know, on the other side of town there. And he basically, you know, doesn't want to help them out right away. And by the, by the end of this issue, he hits the streets and he sees all the destruction that's happened as a result of this this giant kaiju and and uh you know he's it looks like he's gonna help them out now so we'll see what happens but yeah you know it's it's very surface level there's not much to it um i think it's not trying to be something that it isn't uh but it was fun and it made me laugh so i gave it a 3.75 nice all right next up we got teenage mutant ninja turtles yusagi yujimbo where when number one that's a bit of a mouthful but yeah this is uh hold on let me actually show you the cover of this one this is a cool cover this is one of those like fold out ones uh you getting that yeah it looks good yeah this is one of those fold out covers uh which are you know really cool looking and uh basically this is really awesome. This is basically combining two uh, properties. I'm a huge fan of. Uh, this is written and uh, written and drawn by Stan Sakai, who's the creator of Usagi Ujimbo, which is the uh, the samurai uh, samurai um, um, rabbit. And he actually was on the Ninja Turtles cartoon back in the day. He's also crossed over with the Ninja Turtles maybe like two or three times prior to this in the comics. Uh, during the black and white boom of comics, like, you know, uh, 80s time when the Ninja Turtles became, like, very popular, uh, Stan Sakai was also writing and drawing his own book that was a black and white book, Yusagi Ujimbo, around the same period of time. And so they've been around both of the, these properties for, like, you know, going on almost 40 years, 30-something years at this point, right? So probably 40 years. So, like, the fact that this guy, and I just checked his birthday because he's an older gentleman. Uh, older Japanese gentleman. He, um, uh, he's about next month. He's going to turn 70 years old. So this guy is still fucking out there doing it. And I love his cartooning. I'm a big fan of it. I've met him at the, sh at the comic shows before I have like all the Usagi books. I have a commission of his on my wall of Usagi. So I'm like, I'm a big fan of the Usagi stuff. I love samurai type stuff. And, uh, yeah. And I like, I love the Ninja Turtles. So like, this is an easy, easy sell for me. And uh, I just love his cartooning, like all like the the pencil marks, like the inking that he does, the the characters in his world. And then this issue is basically sets up where Usagi, they're basically trying to help some sort of people in need on their, you know, they're on their travels, like a town that's getting attacked by some sort of creatures of some sort that they end up, you know, um, taking care of in this issue. And, um, you know, the, his stories are quite simple for the most part. They're usually... He's because he's like a Ronin. Uh, I I think he's a, no, he's not a Ronin, but he he basically he's one of these samurais that just travels around and like he ends up helping folks and this kind of stuff. And it, it, half the issue you get the Usagi story, and then the other half of the issue you basically have the setup of the Ninja Turtles in their time and place, who end up infiltrating like um I, I don't know like a lab of some sort. Again, it's kind of like par for the course for a lot of Ninja Turtles, Turtle stories. They end up taking out a bunch of bad guys and robots and things like that. During the fight, they end up uh, going into a um, a time machine that's located in the lab, and the time machine transports them to Usagi Ujimbo's time. And again, these are just two properties that really work good together in the sense that, you know, Ninja, Samurai, Japan, all that kind of stuff that they have, like, connected between these two. They're both animals, right? They're both an anthropomorphic animal-type books. 
Uh, and they're all they're again, they're from the same era. So they really just go really well together in that sense. So yeah, at the end of the issue, they basically go back to Usagi's time in Japan and, and they, and they come across him and some of his, uh, his buddies there. And I guess we'll see what entails in the, in the, in the rest of the series. I think it's only a five issue mini series, but yeah, I mean, great package. Like I said, great cartooning, fun story. If you're a fan of these characters or the creator, I think it's an easy, easy sell. And I give it a 4.5. I just, it was just a really, it was just a joy to read. I had a lot of fun with it. And as simple as the stories always are, I think with Usagi and some of the Ninja Turtle stuff, it's just, you know, it's, uh, it's, you know, comfort food essentially. So, <laughs> uh, all right, next up, we got Nemesis Reloaded number four, Chris. Yeah, got my physical issue of this year. Nice. Now this, this, uh, doesn't disappoint, let's say. I'm not sure what's going on. I don't remember reading much, but it was ultra violent in there. Nemesis is doing his thing. And I think the big takeaway from this issue is that I think there might be more Nemesis coming in 2023. And I'm all for it. Yeah. Did you hear that? Or you just think by the end of this issue, it seems like there's... No, I thought, isn't there like some big game? There was a reveal, not a reveal, but an ad for something in this issue here. I don't know if that was a Nemesis series, though, was it? I'm not too sure. I'm not, that's the way I understood it. Maybe i got to take another look at it. I don't think you're wrong <clears throat> based off the fact that it seems like there should be a lot more story to tell and there's only one more issue, right? So I don't think you're wrong. Yeah. Right? Yeah, okay. So, yeah. I, I, and then, I, you know, with, with this Millerverse that's coming up, what if Nemesis is the big bad in the Millerverse? It's very possible. I, that wouldn't be too bad either. He is one of the... Well, he's one of the enemies, you know, like they have all these heroes that are going to, mm -hmm. I don't know, try and string together in some sort of giant crossover and i imagine nemesis is gonna be part of this somehow and i don't think he's gonna be a good guy not the way you uh you can't turn this guy around no 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 he's irredeemable this guy yeah absolutely no i mean yeah i mean in this issue it starts off with him killing again he's just tracking down and revenge killing all these people that basically took out his parents back in the day the police force or the team that basically the strike that took him out and um buddy here he, he puts in the hospital like i guess like he's like uh i don't know if he's like the commissioner or a police chief or something like that right or is he the mayor in this there's a mayor also in the mix here somewhere that yeah it's not the whole crew but he's not killing him nicely either but he he has to he has to you know be brave about the whole situation and basically nemesis says yeah come meet me here and uh, if you come and meet me here, even though you're laid up in the hospital, cause I put you there right now, I will, uh, I will leave everybody else alone essentially, but I want you to come to me and you know, so he's like, okay, well I, he, he figures he's walking into a trap, but he's like, if this is the only way that he'll kind of stop all this shit that he's doing. And he's kind of like the last man standing. It seems like out of everyone that he's tracked down and killed at this point. So, uh, yeah, he goes there. Yeah, exactly. And falls into his trap and gets set up to like, he's hooked up to like a bomb or something at the end of this. And, and then the issue kind of ends with us getting the last mission when he was getting trained, like the Batman kind of training that he went through in his past. And I don't know how they're going to connect whatever happened. I'm guessing whatever happened on this mission, they're somehow going to connect into the events of what's been happening in the main storyline. I, I would think, uh, or maybe what's to come, right? Because they kind of, yeah. They kind of hint at some big happening at the end here, something like he was about to go inside this mansion, and then whatever whatever this was was supposed to be his last mission, kind of before he signed off and became like a super villain, like essentially, right? So I, I don't know. I, I liked it though, and uh, I mean, again, uh, we love the artist on this book. Like he he, yeah. he killed it. Uh, I can't wait to get him back on Batman. Quite uh, quite frankly, though, because I think I just like to see him on Batman. But I think. This is a great looking book, uh, nonetheless. Like it's still an awesome looking title, right? So, um, but yeah, I mean, you know, it's Batman, so I want to see him. On Batman. <laughs> so, what'd you give this one? Yeah, the things I, I'll give it three point. I'll give it a four, even. I liked it. Still good. I'll give it's it three. unapologetically. You know, bad. You know, I'm I'm looking forward to see how this ends. Like, if he's gonna, I guess, win. If he wins, that means like freaking the world loses. So, I want to see how this plays out. Yeah, same. I'm looking forward to more. Yeah, I give it a 3.75 this issue. I just see more. I just feel like these are so so sparse, some of these issues. You know, it's sparse. I yeah. need ah, fucking I need more of this story, right? Like, it's always a good time, uh, you know, seeing this guy be a bad, dude, a bad guy, essentially. But yeah, I need more. 
Uh, and then uh, Ambassadors number two, also a Mark Millar book that came out this week. I guess this is every two weeks, this one, because this just came out two weeks ago, the first issue. Yeah, I guess maybe he had these all lined up. Oh, I imagine he would, because these are all different artists, so it's not like people, you know, like, you know, someone's running the clock. He probably has them all lined up and uh, yeah. doing what they do, so. Yeah, and this yeah is but I read this one. It was another quick read for me here just before the show went on, and it's... I like the way this story moves, you know, it's not moving any which way I thought it would. It's moving just more like a regular comic. I, you know, like you said, I thought these were all going to be, you know, one shot, you know, okay, this is going to be whatever, code name India, everything's going to happen in India. They have another guy from Mexico, but everybody just kind of just merges on and the story moves the way it should. You know, it sounds like these powers don't come uh, without any sort of costs involved, but uh, I guess we'll see how it goes. Yeah, I like this. Like I said, like it's a it's a pretty easy uh, concept to get on board with. Um, you know, every issue with a new good artist on board uh, telling the story of a new hero that they're basically, um, you know, uh, rounding up in this story. Good people. They want to make sure that they're good people that will kind of, I guess, be responsible with the powers that they're being granted. Uh, and yeah, in this issue, we see the first person that they've basically given powers to is this guy, uh, basically the guy from India, uh, who's going to represent India, the country. And there's a whole interesting dialogue, I think, between like, you know, oh, is, is this how my suit has to be? It's a little on the nose and, you know, cause it's like the colors of his flag, the flag of the country. Yeah. And then he was just like, uh, you know, he clearly has different ideas for like his name and his costume. And, and this girl is just like, yeah, no, this is, this is what we all decided on. We've been working really hard on this. All these comic book artists, over a hundred of them. This is the only thing they could agree on. Or something like that. So I was like, okay, that's kind of interesting. And like, I like the, I like how the guy, I think it may, was it the guy at the end of the last issue? I don't know, but there's a Mexican guy that shows up in this, I guess, Mexico. Uh, so Mexico. Yeah, it looks like. But his name is like Gringo Blanco or something. It's like white man. He comes in smoking a joint. They're like, oh, sorry, you can't smoke that in here. He's like, oh, sorry. He's like, oh, it's the Indian guy. Hey? And, and there's a whole <laughs> kind of interesting, um, I, you know, I'll leave it for you guys to check out if you haven't seen it. There's a cool little twist, I think, about the a reveal, let's say, about the India, why they picked this guy and like kind of how he came about, like how he got there, like in this situation that was kind of interesting. I think it's better left on said. So, yeah, no, it was good. He kind of, you know, he started his training in this. And by the end of the issue, it kind of seems that uh, another organization is trying to get involved in, uh, in the, you know, what, sh what she has uh, planned for bringing all these superheroes together, right? They're trying to mess up the her whole uh, rollout, essentially. So, yeah, I liked it. Um, you know, Carl Kershaw is no Frank Quietly, the artist on the first issue, but the art wasn't bad by any means. The, these are all going to be great artists. Mark Miller has a great eye for artists. He always gets the best artists that money can buy to work with him because a lot of his shit turns into Netflix shows. So, like, all these guys, they, they're happy to work with them. Uh, you never hear any bad things about any of the artists that work with them, like, you know, bad fallout relationships or anything like that. And he always works with great great fucking artists the artist that's on the next issue next issue travis charay literally i don't think has drawn comics in like 15 fucking years i think so this is oh, wow he, i i i mean i'm sure he already has handed his issue in or else they wouldn't have advertised it but the fact that this guy's drawing a comic is a big fucking deal like this guy he's an amazing artist i think that really became famous in the 90s that we really haven't seen much work from so like that's a really really big fucking deal that he's drawing the issue that's coming out next week i think like legitimately it's probably been at least 10 years since we've seen anything from this guy so like that's a it's really cool that he's getting these artists to come forward some of these guys and frank quietly like i said he might draw one issue a year and that was it last week so like <laughs> you know i mean these are these are big names that this guy's pulling so well so what'd you give this I give it a 3.75. I think it's better than I thought it'd be. And I think there's one line in there in this comic there where the, you know, the powers that be don't want, you know, the ordinary people to get power. You know, I thought that was very uh, yes. telling of what this series and what this issue is all about. Yeah, I agree. 3.75 out of 5 for me as well. And it's been enjoyable. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it more. And if it's like a every two week type of thing, that's good too. I like, I like yeah. how they keep up that pace. Uh, all right, so up next, a couple more here. I read Phantom Road number two. Uh, this is uh, the Jeff Lemire image title uh, that came out. Um, you know, first issue came out a few weeks ago. I really enjoyed the first issue, and I enjoyed the second issue even more, I would say. I'm really enjoying this book, and it's probably the best 
thing I've seen Lemire do after the last couple of things kind of fell flat for me that, uh, and I'm a guy who was a big fan of his. I pick up everything he brings out, but the last two things for the first time in a long time, I dropped at least in issues. And I figured I'd revisit maybe in the collections or something at some point, which was little monsters. And that other one, the black uh, bone orchard book, both from him. He has an exclusive through image now. So he kind of mostly just does stuff through them as a result. Um, yeah, I've really, really liked this so far though. This one's really working for me. Uh, yeah, again, more like supernatural type stuff going on here. Um, these two people that met in this car crash with this woman, um, uh, she got, her husband got killed on a car crash on the side of the road. This truck driver pulled this truck over to kind of help her. They came across some like weird glowing artifact in the middle of the road. And then basically it looks like they got transported to like, the land of the dead or something or something in between. And that's how I felt about the first issue. Now on this issue, they basically come across this truck, this like uh, uh, truck stop in the middle of nowhere. And from inside the actual truck stop, it looks like the world's going on outside, but from the outside looking in, it's not like they're just in like the wasteland or like in the land of the dead again. So that's kind of weird. And they're like, what the fuck's going on? And then he comes across the dude that I mentioned in the first issue that he saw in the washroom. That was very odd that he that spoke to him at the urinal, which is a situation you don't want to be in. <laughs> uh, he ends up meeting him again in this truck stop. And then it seems like this guy is basically the messenger to let him know that that is indeed what has happened. He basically, he puts, you know, uh, salt on the, on the, uh, on the table to basically let them know, like, listen, this is our, your world. And this is the afterlife. And there's some connecting lines sometimes. So basically like a limbo or some sort of like passageway from one place to the other. That's basically where they are right now. And he said, listen, I don't know why you got mixed up in this. I don't know why that artifact and everything else. Like you'll learn more. I'm happy to let you know at some point, you know, as you go on in your journey, like I'm going to try to help you and direct you to kind of get what you have to get done. Uh, just keep following this road. And uh, he basically says, you know, you're probably not going to see me for a bit now, but, you know, go back out there and hit the road and just keep going straight. And the woman freaks out. She tries to get away, but then she can't. She has, like, some internal issues. Like, she feels, like, pain, like pain in her stomach, and she, like, can't actually walk at a certain point. So she ends up going back to the truck where the guy is. And apparently if they separate from their kind of mission or something, this ends up happening to them. They're drawn towards whatever that artifact is. It's basically pulling them towards uh, – towards their their objective here and they have no choice in the matter it looks like so yeah they basically uh and then at the end of this issue like one of those creatures basically pops out of like nothing out of like thin air it seems like and attacks her the guy beats the shit out of it and then it basically the next time they look over at the thing dead on the ground that he just beat the shit out of it morphed into what looks like a human so they're again they're kind of on the borderline that they, this guy was talking about between you know the afterlife and not and it seems like that's kind of fucking with their perception and what's happening to them and everything else. And, and yeah, there's a lot of mystery and intrigue in, involved right now. And uh, I'm just along for the ride. I'm enjoying it so far and uh, really, really interesting stuff. So I, I give this one, I give this a 4.25. I, I need to know more about this and I'm, and I'm enjoying it. It's well-written. And uh, like I said, in the first issue, if you're like a fan of Stephen King or something like that, I think this would be right up your alley, this book. Uh, then next up we got, Fantastic Four, number six. Um, This was all right. I think next issue is the big issue, Chris, that you were looking forward to checking out. I think, was it uh, 800 yeah. or something? Yeah, like, yeah, it was some legacy number. Um, This was just <laughs> a, a nice one-and-done kind of science story of the, the Fantastic Four coming together as a family and doing their science thing. And uh, basically, they, they find this, like, there's this whole area that's polluted, like the water and everything. And, uh, and they can't basically like Reed can't figure out a way to unpollute the water. Like they basically, there's that weird panel here. If you look at it, doesn't look very, <laughs> like he basically periscopes his eye out to kind of look inside or like, like a microscope inside the water <laughs> kind of looks like a flesh colored penis of some sort. Coming out of his <laughs> when he just put his head closer to it. Anyways, so I'm like, well, that was kind of a weird choice. <laughs> I did want to point that out because it made me laugh. I was like, that's kind of, <laughs> you know, I'm reading books about giant cock shoes this week. Well, I maybe got... it's a tribute to uh, the giant cock shoe. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I don't know what's going on with my comics I read this week, but yeah. Uh, yeah, so... <laughs> 
So that happens. So he inspects the water. He kind of says to Johnny, well, listen, why don't you boil the water basically to disinfect it, the bacteria that's in it. And maybe that will help. And then basically cool it down so we can introduce, you know, the, uh, you know, all the fish and stuff back into the water because, you know, the thing is like pulling all the turtles out and everything. And they're basically trying to like make it so like this uh, area isn't polluted anymore. But they, they are unsuccessful. The bacteria apparently is growing at like at a crazy rate. Um, they can't figure it out. Reed can't wrap his head around it. Then Johnny of all fucking people throws out an idea that he thinks is a stupid idea, but he gets something from what he says that kind of triggers this idea in his head that, yeah, you know what? We can do that. And basically what they figure out is that Sue can, uh, basically block the sun, uh, for three days in certain areas that will come down on this, uh, on this, on this, uh, river or whatever it is, uh, lake. And as a result, all the bacteria will die because it won't have the sunlight or something like that. And, and, uh, and then basically we'll solve the issue that way. And, uh, Johnny basically flies her up there and they spend three uh, days together up in like the, the fantastic car. And, uh, she ends up blocking out the sun and uh, using her powers. And then they come back down to earth, having solved everything. And they think they're big heroes and look what we did. You know, uh, no, th no, no need to kind of applaud because they see like a bunch of people by the site that they basically saved. And it turns out that it's Maria Hill, formerly of S.H.I.E.L.D., who's there with some sort of government agency because I don't know if S.H.I.E.L.D.'s a thing really at this point. Um, but she's basically like, well, listen, you played your card. Like you basically showed us that at any time you can you can basically end existence because you can block out the fucking sun. So you're in trouble. And and then uh, Johnny's like, you know, hey, hey, Sue, let's get the fuck out of here. And they basically try to boogie at the end of this issue and they're on the run, it seems like. So I guess whatever the fallout of this will, is maybe what they'll be uh, dealing with in the next issue and whatever else happens, right? So, uh, you know, it's all right. Um, the book's kind of growing on me. It does have the characterizations of these people. I think it's a really good characterization of the Fantastic Four. They deal with a lot of one and done science kind of adventure type shit. So if that's your, you know, I mean, that's that is doing Fantastic Four justice. I just don't think there has been much movement on this superheroing aspect of the team as of yet in this title. So now they got the characters, but just crappy stories. That's what it is. Yeah. You hit it on the head. So I got to get, I got to stick with the 3.5 on this one. It's, it's, it's not a hundred percent clicking with me yet. I mean, I'm still six issues in. So obviously there's something that keeps me kind of continuing to read it online. I'm, I'm not buying the title, but uh, this, the, the physical issues, but you know, I want to really like this. I like the Fantastic Four. It's not bad, but it's not by any means great, in my opinion. Like Dan Slott's run before this got the superhero aspect of the Fantastic Four down, and that was a great book, like because of it. Like, this is just like, you know, I, I, they really just need to bring everything together, I think, that and then actually, like you say, tell worthwhile tell uh, stories essentially in the Marvel Universe, which I don't think they're doing right now, right? So maybe he's just trying to get a feel for it. We'll see. Maybe, maybe this is what the book is. So I don't know. Uh, next up, Chris, you got X-Men 21. What'd you think of this? Got my issue here. More brood. More brood. More brood. <laughs> I, I think this, this one wasn't too bad. It, you know, whether I like it or not, there's brood stories all over here. But uh, what I like here is Cyclops freaking kind of doubling down on his uh, his attitude there, where he says, "Let's just kill the brood and wipe them out." And you know, from you know, it seems what these broods are under control of the brood. You know, I'm I'm not really up for that whole storyline to begin with. You know, if they wipe out the brood, you know, leave one floating in a freaking frozen frozen iceberg, you know, to be reawakened, you know, when the time comes. But hey, doesn't Marvel have like the rights to alien now, so they can just get rid of this brood anyways, and maybe uh, introduce aliens? I mean, into, Conan, uh, Conan has showed up in the Marvel series universe when they had. Yeah, it. you can have you know, the universe is pretty big. They can have the aliens floating around somewhere, and uh, you know, see what happens. But but otherwise, you know, like the the story itself, it's still a good X Men story. But uh, I'm just waiting for all this stuff then. I did like the crossover. I think this is where the crossover starts with Captain Marvel. Uh, they do get a, a distress call from Captain Marvel. And look at this brew guy walking around in a suit. What the hell is that about? Hey. I'd, rather have, I'd rather have the brew just be these freaking mindless hive beasts, you know, like just a force of nature that they just got to wipe out. Hey, man. But, 
That's Brew. I like Brew. He's from Wolverine and the X-Men, a, a very beloved series of mine. So you watch what you say about Brew. Uh, <laughs> I can keep Brew there, but when he goes to sleep, I guess bad things happen. <laughs> <clears throat> I, I like the Jean Grey nightmare, like how she took Nightmare out in this. That was pretty awesome too in this issue. Yeah, it puts him in his place. And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, like, yeah. I said, it just sounds like they're gonna kind of. He's off the table for a while until uh, they decide he's ready to come back again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I, I'm still enjoying this. Uh, like, yeah, I don't think this issue is anything spectacular in terms of a standout issue, but um, yeah, it's still always enjoyable. It's pretty consistent in the sense that I always enjoy reading the x-men title um and uh you know always good art i really like the team i like that the team has changed a couple times at this point you know what i mean like I, i'm yeah. dig i'm digging a, a lot of that kind of like the choices that jerry duggan makes on this book as we talked about before i've mentioned it many times i think i just always find uh interesting for an x-men book so yeah i think here they're just buying time for the end of the sinister event and some big things could be coming up you know at least from what i read in there or what i've seen in some of the covers of the solicitations over the next few issues. So like I said, I'm waiting for all this stuff to end. And I think what's fall of X is their next big event or something. Yeah. I might. Um, I don't know. I, I, I'm excited for it. We'll see how it goes. I agree. Uh, I hope they don't screw it up. And I really hope this isn't the end of the Krakoa era, but at the same time, you know, depending on how they end it and what direction they go in, if that is the case, then we'll see what happens. Right. But uh, I've, I've enjoyed the last few years of X-Men. I don't think it's going to be the fall. It might be the fall of Krakoa, but it'll come back in the end somehow. That seems to be a mainstay right now is Krakoa. Yeah, well, that's what I mean. I think it, I think they'd be leaving a lot uh, of opportunity on the table for these characters if they were to change. Yeah, where, they, where are these people going to go? They can go back to live in New York? No. Yeah, exactly. Well, all right. So what would you give this out of five then? I'll um, still give it a 3.5. Nothing crazy. I, I'll give it a 3.75. You can put uh, three point seven five. Okay. You know, especially compared to the the batch of comics this week. I was to say, yeah. Uh, all right. Speaking of the batch of comics this week, we got Captain America Cold War number one. You got a cover there, Chris, or did you pick this up? Or I did. I didn't know. I just read this one online. What did you think of this? I'm new to this. You know, the the last Captain Marvel or Captain America comic I bought was the Captain America Zero, and all this sort of stuff mm. was just starting and. Seems like a lot has been going on in this Captain America series, or and the whatever the Liber Sentinel of Liberty with uh, Sam Wilson. Yeah. I don't know I thought it was an interesting read. You know, I don't like the way they have Bucky Barnes as a bad guy. You know, I just got used to him as being a good guy, and I know Steve thinks he's working on the, you know, he's working as a bad guy, you know, for a good intent. But I know at the end of this one, it seems like Bucky Barnes is playing his game, and if he's bad, he's bad. You know. Uh, like I think the ultimate outcome may be good, but it's not looking good for uh, Steve and his friends there. Yeah. Um, so a couple of things. I did read the first trade of the Captain America series, like I said earlier, and I really, really enjoyed it. That being said, there's still like a second trade of content that uh, of issues, like another five, six issues that hasn't come out yet that happens prior to this event. So I might be a little lost as to maybe some of the things that occurred from the, the, the that first trade to the to this point. Um, I, they did establish this whole kind of inner circle, kind of secret society type shit in the first trade, though, that, that Bucky was working for. And at that time, he did tell Cap that he's basically, yeah. Being yeah, he's going to work from the inside. Yeah, he's like being a double agent and shit. But I'm with you. By the end of this, this does not seem to be the case. It does look that he's a bad, he's a bad guy. I, I'm less interested in him being a bad guy, so I hope that's not the case. I do like though how they also included the fact that um, uh, uh, Captain America had a son in Dimension Z with uh, from uh, that was from a uh, Rick Remender's run when he used to be at Marvel. Like this is a long time ago, so they picked up on the storyline from back then, which I don't feel they've even referenced since then. He had like a a child with uh, with Peggy Hill in in Dimension Z. Uh, it was a really weird storyline. Like it was like Arnim Zola was in it. And like, it was a whole thing that Rick Remender did years ago. And the fact that he's still kind of in play and exists, I really kind of liked how they, they brought him into this. Uh, yeah. But you know, the, the, the I'm not a big fan of this dimension Z though. You know, I'm happy it's there, but it looks like a lot of like, you know, this is almost like the dark web where, yeah. you know, they're going to get sucked into dimension Z instead of limbo and, you know, do their battle there. So that's kind of taking a bit of the edge off. 
I, I can imagine that a lot of people are with you on that, Chris, because I remember a lot of people not liking Dimension Z, the whole storyline that they did. It was actually drawn by John Romita Jr., who's on Amazing Spider-Man now, oh. of course. Um, you know, an artist of his caliber with some of the weird looking things he can draw. Obviously, I think it it was a good sandbox to play in for him personally, like an artist of his, you know, that he draws shit like he does blocky characters as Christine likes to always tell me. <laughs> um, I got to say though, Carlos Magno, the artist on this book, I'm not a fan of, I, he's very inconsistent. He looks really bad in certain parts. I really dislike, I mean, even this, like, what the fuck is this? Yeah. Like, basically did the predator, like fucking hand and like arms fucking slap with Arnold there. Yeah. Like, get the fuck out of here. With yeah. that. Like I don't know, man. I'm just not a fan of art. Yeah, like these splash pages there with with Steve coming out of the fire. He should be looking awesome, and he doesn't. Yeah, I just some places he looks good, other places he doesn't. I'm just not a fan of his. I find him to be very inconsistent. Uh, you know, I thought this was okay. I wanted to like this a lot more, and I don't yeah. know if it's because I haven't read what like everything that's come before it. But I really love the first trade paperback of these writers run on this series. So I, I might stick with this. I might continue to read it online with the tie-ins with the Captain America series. But uh, I just, I wasn't a fan of the artist and the story was just okay. And I'm not a fan of the fact that Bucky might be a bad guy. I'm very torn on this one. I, I want to say it's bad, but it's just not that good to me. <laughs> yeah, I'm not too upset that I'm not buying this. I'll say yeah. that much. Yeah, it's, it's, it's no, I might read it all the way through, but it's not like wow, I gotta get this. You know, some big things are going on, I gotta be on top of this. Yeah, it, I don't think there's much, I much in there. That's I don't think it's ter terrible. It's just I'm not awfully interested in what they're selling me here. Let's just say, yeah. That. Uh, so what'd you give this? I got a 3.5. I almost want to give it a 3.25. I really dislike the art on this one. Uh, yeah, I think I have to a 3.25. I didn't like the art, so they really killed it for me. So I hope that they have, I, I know they're going to have other artists for obviously the ongoing series. I hope of, of cap and Sam and right. And yeah. I think it's just moving through their issues, almost like the dark web. So yeah. Okay. So we'll see. We'll see. I might read more. I'm going to probably give it another issue for sure. Well, before we move on though, I do have a couple of covers here. I want to put out. Yeah, man. Got a couple more of these Alex Ross covers. I think this is a, uh... I think this one's Moon Knight here. This is the Kingpin one. Okay. Oh, yeah, and this one's Carnage. I don't know how they get a hell of cover on Carnage, but whatever. You're go you're all couple I didn't read them, though. The Kingpin one looks awesome, though. You're all yeah, in. Yeah, the Kingpin one looks great. You're all in on That's Moon Knight. You're all in on these Alex Ross covers, though, man. That's cool. That's well, except those the Spidey Rogue villains. I know a lot of them are Spider-Man villains. Like, they have Vulture, Electro, Rhino. Like, I I'm missing a bunch, though. There's some... I don't know. This came at the wrong time for me. When I was trying to cut everything on, that's when all these came through the... <laughs> yeah. Through the whatever, the pull list. Yeah. And if I pushed that, you know, my cuts a little while, I'd be having all of these. And these are all the ones to have. But I say that about all of them, too. It's like, oh, I got to get all these freaking... Uh, no, it's... All it's, Hellfire it's, Gala covers. I got to get all these stupid uh, ones. I don't even know what some of them these are anymore. I mean, they always got a gimmick going on for sure, but I, I wouldn't say it's every day that you get, like, this many Alex Ross covers coming out like it, like this. Like, he's always doing covers, yeah. but not like this, like Virgin variants where there's no words on them like that. Like, this is kind of cool for Red Skull. And these aren't ratio covers either. You know, these are oh. just cover Bs. Well, that's where I think before when he did the Heroes, those, those might have been either 1 in 10 or 1 in 25 ratios. You know, at my local uh, comic shop, they're selling these ones ten bucks right off the bat. Yeah. So, and you're not paying that. So, right? So, right? I'll ask you later about that. Oh. But uh, <laughs> that's what they're that's what they're on the wall for. If maybe if if you're walking off the street. I hope not. But anyway. <laughs> right. And if you want, well, we can talk about this afterwards. Sorry. He's a preferred customer, folks. <laughs> maybe. Yeah. Cheesecake. <laughs> Drops money there, guys. All right. So uh, let's go into some news very quickly, though, guys. Some uh, in the news here. What do we got going on? There's a couple of new series that were mentioned that are probably going to be talked about in the next solicits that we do in a week or two, whenever they come out. Uh, I'm sure they'll be in those, but there's been a couple of interesting announcements I figure were worth mentioning, though. One of them being a Hickman announcement. Ooh. That I that I guess was the big deal book that we were supposed to be like 
hyped up about, but instead I thought it was the Ultimate Invasion book that they 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 talked about, which is also going to be a big deal. So I guess he's doing two things for Marvel when he comes back. He's doing that. But the big thing that he had teased, like, I don't know, like a year ago or something that he says, this is going to be like my Sandman or whatever for the Marvel Universe. It's basically one that he's coming back and writing that's called uh, Gods, where he's redefining Marvel's gods, like the go gods, like all the, like the uh, you know, like the godly characters, like um, the cosmic ones, I believe, the, the ones he's going to be talking about, if I'm not mistaken. So um basically it's him uh working with valerio shitty is this, it's not shitty it's, it's <laughs> i think but uh yeah it's it's just a series that he's going to be doing that's called gods that he's going to be coming i think it's uh uh let's see what he says here wanna uh let's look for some quotes here the the main question posed by gods what happens when the powers that be meet the natural order of things perhaps we'll get an answer when gods hit store this fall uh and yeah i don't know this was like a, supposed to be a big announcement because again he's coming back to write for them this is supposed to be like some you know one of those big in scope game changing type stories and uh he basically says after months of teasing marvel has finally announced details for their next big comic writer jonathan hickman it'll be titled gods and it aims to build a new marvel mythology overflowing with daring concepts intricate systems and fascinating new characters according to the publisher mm -hmm. When I came back to Marvel a few years ago, I wrote two series Bibles. The first was House of X and the other one was Gods. So like, again, if it's like kind of as big in concept as like his rollout for this whole new era of X-Men was this other series that he's talking about here, I'm totally on board. I'm a big fan of Hickman. Um, if he's going to tell some big story and scope, kind of like what he did with House of X, Powers of Ten, that basically set up the new quota, the new status quo of X-Men, I'm going to check this out for sure. Uh, yeah, I'll probably check this out too, but I can't see that happening, man. Not unless they got him signed as a a Marvel writer or like our editor in chief or something, or like some like brain trust of Marvel. If he's here just to write a series, I don't know. I don't have good hopes for it. And there is a trailer out right now, which basically the shows the the upcoming comic illustrates a conversation between Doctor Strange and a mysterious character named Wynn who is a vital member of an eons old hierarchy that includes the omnipotent rulers of the universe, such as eternity, uh, infinity and the living tribunal. Yeah. Like these are like Jim Starlin cosmic type yeah. characters who I'm always a fan of when they show these type of people, because they're not really characters that are all used all that often. They basically are in the cosmic stories or if some big deal type shit with like the watcher or something happens yeah. in the universe, they might emerge. Right. So that's kind of, I think it's like an area of Marvel Universe stuff that really hasn't been touched like on in a, like in a while. So I think there's room to kind of tell interesting stories here. Whether or not you care about it, I think you, your own mileage will vary on that. But I think it's worth checking out just because Hickman usually comes with big ideas like this. And he usually like, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm a fan of his. So I'm, I'm going to be checking it out for sure. But I, I agree with what you're saying too, Chris. We'll see. We'll see what happens with that, right? They always say, oh, this is a new series of epic proportions and blah, 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 blah. But when it comes yeah. to Hickman, like his his batting average when it comes to that kind of shit, I think is, is pretty good. Like he actually does come through. Like, I mean, we're still like, again, the X-Men, we're still playing out ideas that he planted seeds on years ago that he hasn't even been on the titles for a while. Right. Like, and, and <clears throat> the stuff that he put in, yeah. most, you know, was, was a result of him. So we'll, we'll see. I don't know what he's going to do for Marvel universe or what the, what's the outcome of this shit. But uh, also DC comics just announced a uh, new teen Titans and Superman comics from writer, Mark Wade, who's uh, a favorite of mine as well. He's been doing some good work over at DC. He's been doing World's Finest recently. And it looks like he's going to be doing a, another, I guess, a spinoff World's Finest title called World's Finest Teen Titans uh, with artist Emanuela Lupacino. And basically, I guess it's going to be, yeah, maybe like, I guess in the same type of vibe of the World's Finest Batman Superman, but it's going to be with the Teen Titans. So. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to pick it up in physical release, but I'll definitely check it out because I, I like what he's been doing with World's Finest. Now, I don't know if that means if that's going to be the end of World's Finest. Maybe this is going to replace that. Uh, maybe I hope not. not. Yeah, I agree. But Mark Wade, he almost is, he's almost kind of writing his own DC Universe stuff that's all not not canon, let's say. they got to put him on a canon title and freaking liven something up, you know? It looks like, it looks like they got Wonder Woman coming back to the fold there with... Uh, with her, with her rebirth, they got to put him on like just the regular Superman or something. 
Yeah, I agree with you. He definitely is kind of, I guess, carving out his own. He's just like, he just writes classic superhero type stuff so well. I think that's like his bread and butter. Like, that's why I think they're kind of, they're putting him on books like this. I guess maybe it's like, like, like stuff that he wants to do. Maybe that's good. Yeah. But it's weird because it's, it seems they're trying to say, I mean, DC now continuity is basically mm. threw that out the window. Everything yeah. counts, whatever that shit was from the dark crisis or whatever that was right it was like every story counts everything counts like all this continuity like whatever so that's because it seems like these feel like throwback stories but they're trying to say it's in current continuity somehow so i don't know what the like you're right like look what happened with lazarus planet is that not supposed to be something that's been happening right now right that, that mark yeah. Wayne wrote that or headlined that one right so i don't know um but yeah well, there's also another superman uh black label coming out too i don't know if you heard that one or i, I know you're about to talk about that sorry yeah, my bad. Yeah. no that's all right that's the other mark wade book this one sounds interesting i'm, yeah, I'm gonna go for that that's i'll go for a black label superman all day superman the last days of lex luther also written by mark wade uh it is a black label book and i guess uh superman's trying to save lex luther from dying in this so it kind of feels like uh all-star superman where he's kind of i don't know if you've ever read that chris that's a really good one where he, it's kind of like last days of superman where he finds out he's gonna die and he, and it kind of goes through this whole like trials of like every issue is basically yeah. trying to do a bunch of shit as superman in his final days uh but yeah he's writing a superman miniseries uh titled superman last days of lex luther promising emotional depth and a physical <laughs> philosophical exploration of the differences between superman and his greatest foe all while the man of steel tries to prevent Luther's death sounds heavy yet still taps into the most appealing thing about Superman his willingness to do the right thing for anyone. This sounds fucking great. This book I I'm on board 110 fucking percent on this one. I'll pick up the, yeah, you too, eh, Chris on this one. Yeah, it sounds yeah, good. I for that for sure. Yeah, this is, this just sounds like a great story. And like I said, Mark Wade, I've trust in him and he writes a great Superman. I mean, he's, he's who wrote uh, kingdom come of course, uh you know he's written great dc shit so like i mean the fact that he's back working for dc now i'm really happy about it. and th and this sounds like th this sounds like uh if you're gonna pick up any books out of these two that he's writing pick up this one over the teen titans one i would say I, even though world's finest has been fun and stuff but this this sounds like it's gonna be worthwhile uh this one so and finally one other announcement uh, in the wake of uh, the news of Fall of X, we see a new team of Dark X Men assemble uh, against the world that hates and fears them. Did you see this one? There's going to be a Dark X Men coming this August, Chris. Which is, uh, I'm not familiar with the writers uh, or the artist Steve Fox and Jonas Scharf, but uh, it's going to have a team of Madeline Pryor, Havoc, Archangel, Gambit, Azazel, Zero. I know Gambit ends up in there, but. Zero, Albert, and M plate. I like that we're getting Havoc and Madeline Pryor back together. Yeah. Like Angel. Like that's kind of I'm digging that. Um, so yeah, I'm up in the air about this one, but this uh does sound interesting, the uh, pitch for this book. Um if they got a hard out a hot artist on this, then for sure. Yeah, I almost wish that we had Zeb Wells of the team of Hellions back on this one. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like Dark X-Men book. Because uh because as dark and fucked up as that book was, like, uh, you know, I think it was, it was, it was, it was funny. It had great art. It was, you know, it was a dark yeah. humor. It had a really good dark humor to it, that book. And I hope that's kind of what they're going for with this one because Madeline Pryor's on the team. And uh, it says, picking up Madeline Pryor's journey is a wild and terrifying honor. Fox shared, uh, who's the writer, Maddie is coming into Dark X Men with a sense of autonomy she's rarely had over her life, but she's doing so during the fall of X. I don't think it's a spoiler to say things aren't happy go lucky for anyone in the mutant orbit right now. And that includes uh, redheads who've plopped the giant demon castle right off of central park. So there you go. That's, that's kind of where we left it off with, uh, you know, with the end of uh, dark web and uh, everything else. Right. So we'll, uh, well, it, it'd be interesting to see what's happening with her. I might check that one out online if anything. Right. But um, yeah, I'll probably pick up the first issue for sure. Yeah. I'm sure there's some banger covers out there, which we'll take a look at whenever these solicits for that one comes out. Right. So, so there you go. Those are some new series I wanted to announce, but out of all of those, I would say uh, the Hickman gods one and the Superman book by, by Mark Wade are what I'm looking forward to the most out of those. That's yeah. 
those are both going to be good stuff, I think, coming. So that's good to know because I think our, our our lists have been dwindling here, Chris. There hasn't been there's been some slim pickings going around. I think the last few weeks. <laughs> well, have you seen uh, Spider Man Seven up on the wall anywhere? Not yet. I've seen it up on the wall of my store. Thirty bucks, and that's just the regular cover, not the not the variant Spider Boy cover. This is. Crazy. I don't know what's going on in there. I didn't think that story was all that uh, spectacular to begin with, but. It's a hot comic right now, at least. Yeah, well, if anybody wants to buy mine for 30 bucks. <laughs> uh, Chris, what are you uh, looking forward to reading next week? Oh, next week we've got uh, Avengers Assemble Omega, the Punisher 11, She-Hulk 12, Catwoman 54, I think, Deceased number 8, Nightwing 103, and Amazing Spider-Man 24. And from what I hear in Amazing Spider-Man, Big things are going to be going down soon. I don't know. That's what's just what I hear in the rumor mill. I hear someone big might be dying in 25. Oh, interesting. Okay. Speculators, get ready. <laughs> uh, no, that's interesting to hear. I I, I think the, the story has picked up, so I'm looking forward to seeing where it goes um, from here. Let me just pull up my list here. Um, but, yeah, next week, uh, let's see here. Yeah, it's a decent sized week for me. Um, between stuff I'm reading online and uh physical pickups here. Let me see what I got. So that's for the week of April 19th. Sorry, it's just loading. Fucking website. <laughs> well, I think my face is coming back. I can feel mostly everything oh, now. Good, good. <laughs> All right, so we got Batman World uh Superman World's Finest comes out next week. We got Deceased War of the Undead Gods, number eight, Nightwing 103. Oh, that's the last issue of War of the Undead Gods. So looking forward to that. Yep. Super Superman number three, that's been really good. We got Amazing Spider-Man 24, The Forge number two, Punisher 11. Those are ones I'm picking up uh, physically and then stuff I'm reading online. I'm going to join Chris here at the end of Avengers Assemble, Omega number one. Nightcrawlers three, that's the last of the miniseries that have come out. Of yeah, I'll probably read that too, but uh, uh, okay, cool. And I might read Hollow's Eve too. I thought the first Oh, yeah, I'll probably give that a read too. <clears throat> first issue was decent, so I'll probably read that. So, yeah, that's, that's going to do it for what we're looking forward to reading next week, guys. Chris, your favorite book of the week out of this week. What do you got for us? Wasn't a big week, but I'd go with uh, the the ones I'm choosing from X Men and where is it? X Men and Nemesis. But I'm gonna go with Nemesis. So nice. I just like that unbridled violence. Can't go wrong with that. Nice, nice. I like it. Mine's gonna be giant cock. Ju no, no. <laughs> just for this page, the one with him banging the fucking building. No. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> there we go. Ah. <laughs> no, I, I got to go with um, just for the pure joy of it. Uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Usagi Ujimbo, Where When, number one. Uh, written and drawn by a 70-year-old creator, Stan Sakai. Still still doing quality, quality work. Got to give it up to him. I'd say my runner-up was Phantom Road, though, which is also off to a great start, but... Yeah. I know that's got a Netflix series written all over it. I think Phantom Road, yeah, probably. Yeah. We'll see. Or you know, somebody's buying that story. Yeah, well, I wouldn't be surprised, but uh, yeah, it does feel very cinematic. Like I said, the first issue, though, even the way they kind of dropped you in the story and then cut to the the name, the two page spread of the name. I was like, wow, yeah. you guys are really burning <laughs> pages on this title. <laughs> So, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if something's coming uh, from that. Lemire has also sold a lot of his ideas to Hollywood, right? So, uh, Sweet Tooth comes out at the, uh, season two at the end of this month on Netflix, guys. So, there you go. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, that's going to do it for this week, guys. Thanks for tuning in, as always. Uh, once again, check back in the feed. We've had recent episodes of Trade Talk and Kraken Packs with the chat come out. And, uh, yeah, look forward to uh, next week. More comics to always talk about. Chris, you got to go do your homework for the hockey pool that's coming up, my friend. And uh, hockey, hockey playoffs will be starting up, guys. So if you're a fan of hockey, that's always a good time. Go Leafs, go. And, uh, yeah, that's going to do it uh, for us this week. <laughs> Are the Leafs even in? <laughs> <laughs> well, you took it to Tampa with, like, you know, half the team. So that's encouraging. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> there ain't playoffs, though, either. 
Yeah, yeah. So we'll see. Uh, all right, guys. We'll see you guys next time. Thanks, Chris. All right. Cheers.